No, dos, tres. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Vive de Tus Rentas, the podcast that empowers you with the knowledge and the tools to unlock financial freedom through smart investing. I'm your host, Karina Tejo, and today we have a very special guest that I am thrilled to introduce. Joining us is the author of the best selling book, Creative Real Estate Investing, a revolutionary guide that transformed how we think about building wealth in real estate in the real estate market whether you're a seasonal investor or you start or you are starting out today's episode in real today's episode is packaged with insights and strategies designed to elevate your real estate game so make sure to stay tuned because this is an interview that you won't want to miss so let's kick things off and mark can you share with us what inspired you to write the real estate, uh, the creative real estate investing uh, book, and how do you believe it, real estate is in, is in real estate investing? Uh, how do you believe the, the 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 I'm sorry, landscape is changing nowadays? Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. You know, before we started, uh, you know, we, we caught up because we catch up what every about every three to six months. It seems like we're always catching up with each other. And I follow you on social media and I'm sure you do the same. So we're always constantly knowing you're out there cycling and, you know, I cycle. So we sit there and talk about. So we have a lot in common. And I see some of the amazing events that you go to the foods. You know, I, I'm a good foodie. I love good food. And I see you're always posting some amazing photos of food so thank you for sharing that stuff makes me hungry sometimes especially you're lucky in chicago you guys got amazing restaurants up there we do you have to come visit and try it all out <laughs> <laughs> so thanks um so my book um yeah there it is in the background there um creative real estate investing so what happened was you know i started in real estate many many years ago i was started out at the age of 24 25 back in 1995 that's where i really started my career uh doing real estate banking and i did my first creative deal at, uh well actually believe it or not i did my first really creative deal when i was 19. i didn't know it was a creative deal at the time mm -hmm. uh, but then from there um you know i started i got into the business world learning business and so then i got into real estate banking in 1995 and then from there about two i started doing the regular investing you know the fix and flips that's traditional what everybody did but um understanding my background in the real estate banking world and my clients i started to become friends with a lot of investors at the time so i, I started learning a lot of these different strategies learning different things and then i also understand the the lending side of it the note side how to create deals and what makes the deal work and how it would work so when they get financing how they can refinance and get that loan paid off and so they can get a loan traditionally into their name so um that's when i really started my career but what happened was a couple years ago, um, my fiance, um, Ella and I, we've been together for quite some time. Her father was sick and we we're actually, it was two years ago at this time, we were in California, Palm Springs area, taking care of him. And uh, so I had some time and that's when I decided to kind of write the book. So I went through it, took uh, about three months to go through the process writing it and then um, it took, believe it or not, I didn't realize editors take so long. It took the editor almost three months too to go through it. <laughs> oh, wow. And then, uh, yeah. So then uh, published it on Amazon that October. Mm -hmm. And uh, it became, um, the, when I published it for nine days, when it, it became number one on Amazon as a bestseller. So that was in October. So that's what made it launched. And, you know, it figures a couple months later after that chat gtp comes out so i could have done that it would have saved me a lot of time and energy but no i did it the old school way i learned a lot from it that's fantastic i really like it i've actually um gifted it to a couple of friends um i like the fact that it goes straight to the point even with chat gpt today it, it's a little bit of um repetitive stuff but i think the value is there of the book and obviously the price is very affordable so uh one of the core obviously the core themes of your book is creative financing um could you give me um could you give an example of a creative strategy that most investors overlook? Sure. Well, there's so many of them. Um, really, to to understand this whole thing in creative 
creative financing with sellers, to be able to get a deal through a seller financing strategy. So realistically, they are, I call them creative, but they're all seller financing strategies within certain ones. And you just gotta, you can kind of fine tune, mix and match and put them all together. Um, the number one thing, whenever somebody comes to me and they said, hey, I got a deal and I need to figure out how to structure it. There's two things I always wanna know, always. Why are they selling? What's the number one reason why they're selling? Motivation. And what are they planning on doing with the capital? Because if you can understand those two things and you're creative enough, and that's how you can come up with a solution to be able to buy these properties through creative financing strategies. And the reason why I like them, um, instead of always going out there to try to raise capital, especially if you're new into this, you're mm -hmm. using the seller's assets. So you're technically your seller's your partner instead of you going out there and having to ask friends and family about getting capital because you're structured in a way where you're using their property as the leverage for that down payment. Um, I'll give you an example here. Do you have a question or you have anything before I jump in the example? Oh, no, 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 please keep, keep on going. <laughs> so let me give you an example of one. Um, not too long. Actually, it was in spring. So one of my members I had, um, he found a prop. This was straight seller financing, but this is an example of how you can use seller financing. Mm -hmm. And so this gentleman um, was in Georgia. The property slowed down. Um, they, they're not moving very well over there. Um, so he was trying to sell it through seller financing. The property was worth only $128,000, but he wanted $30,000 down. It did not make sense to put that much capital down. Right. So Yep. So in the seller financing world, when I'm talking to sellers, 80% of my conversation is getting to know them just through conversation, really building a rapport. The reason why is when you're doing seller financing, it's like a marriage. You're going to be dating the seller for a while, you know, back and forth. So you're interviewing, uh, they're interviewing you to make sure you're not going to destroy the property and also that you're going to make the payments on time. And at the same time, you should be interviewing them, making sure they're not a crazy seller that's going to be a pain in the butt, which we all had. I'm sure you've had a few of those too. Yes. So uh, in my conversation, I got to know him. I got to know his dog's name, you know, how long has he had the dog? I got to know his children. I got to know his grandkids. I got to know, um, you know, who he banks with. I got to know he's got good credit. He banks at a credit union. He's got good credit. Um, his wife passed away and he's retired. And I'm really getting to just build a rapport to him and just getting to know everything about his kids, his family, everything. So I get to a point and I said to him, um, so when you sell the property, what are you planning on doing with that $30,000? He goes, I need $25,000 to buy a camper. And then I need the rest of the capital. I just want some working capital. So right there, I, I knew what he needed. It was the camper. That was his. Okay. So then I started asking questions having him paint the picture in his mind what he's going to be doing with the camper i'm like oh great what are you planning on doing we have places that you want to go camping oh yes i'm going to the new river in west virginia then in the shindori mountains up okay. into uh up into nashville area into ohio so then i'm asking questions have you been to the new river before have you ever whitewater raft what do you do do you hunt or do you fish do you kayak so i'm pulling all this stuff out of me asking questions out of him asking questions so he's picturing in his mind what he wants to do, visualizing it. It's kind of leading me up to where I want to get, where I, I need to sell him to kind of get the deal. So I'm, I'm picturing all that. And then I go to him. So, well, you're, you've been trying to sell the property for a couple months. You're open to seller financing. I go, what's the issue? I already knew what the issue was, but I'm asking him the issue. I go, what's the issue? He goes, everybody's lowballing me with the down payments and they're saying my payment's too high. So I go to him, I'm going to be frank with you nobody is going to put $30,000 down on a $128,000 home. And I kind of went into it where you can go traditionally to the bank, um, put less capital, you know, using 20% down, you still be less capital and you have a better, better rate. And I ended up buying another asset, another property, if you will, um, that doesn't need as much work. <laughs> this is what, yep. Yeah. But this is what we'll do. I'll give you $3,500 down. You go to the credit union that you said you belong to and you had good credit and so they have amazing rates. You take a loan out for the $25,000. And then what we'll do is on the 20th of every month, we'll go ahead and make the payment on your behalf. And what we'll do is we will go ahead and, um, sorry about that. My phone keeps going off and I don't That's know if he's texting me. So <laughs> let me just turn my uh, thing off. So, um, so then I go to him, uh, what we'll do is on the 20th of every month, we'll go ahead and make a payment directly on your behalf to the credit union directly out of our account. And that portal will set up a Gmail. So whenever there's a payment made or any notification, it goes to you and it'll also come to our bookkeeper. Because of that, we end up getting this deal for $3,500 down. 
amazing for one percent ten percent of what he wanted <laughs> and so and i i have this interview very well structured but i have to plug a, a question here because precisely what most most of the people that are a bit more um how do you call this how do you say that more um not that they don't believe uh, they question this creative financing are people that are involved in real estate meaning realtors and mortgage loan officers and their common question is like who in their right mind will be doing such thing right of course i've been doing this i've been i tell people this is all about sales and building report i'm not saying 100 percent of the population we're going to reach they're going to be jumping into the wagon and saying yes but like you said it's about building report how do you answer that question why do you tell to these realtors that are very savvy in real estate yet so skeptical of creative financing so i've been through several trends i've been through this for many years and it's a cycle typically um some of the older realtors are they've been through it so they know during these type of times they have to adapt to their strategy if they don't adapt to the strategy then they're starving and they end up getting a nine to five job that's usually what ends up happening mm -hmm. and there is some of the older ones are so vanilla and they're old school they learn one way but they are not open-minded to learn other ways of doing this like an example subject to taking over a property subject to existing mortgage written on the hud document a federal document it has on there subject to existing mortgages but they don't understand it so when it comes to that typically i try to educate them if they don't want to listen most of the time they're going to lose that um listing okay. and then at that time we'll just go in behind and just offer i've had situations in a, a prime example I, we had a realtor um wouldn't present the offer to the seller um we we're willing to pay this the realtor their commissions up front when we close on it they didn't have to wait and that, there was plenty of that we we're doing that in our down payment but they didn't even offer didn't even present the offer to the seller the they the listing expired when we went directly to the seller we told the seller hey we put an offer and the seller's like the realtor never told me that i would have been all over that a long time ago i could have sold this three months ago so i don't i i, I prefer working with realtors um and i do work with a lot of realtors i did 18 deals one uh last year with one realtor because they understood my buy box and they understood exactly so those realtors um will make it and the ones that don't uh, make an open-minded they're going to starve and they, they you have to adapt with times and changes and what i found is a lot of the younger realtors nowadays because of social media and because of the internet they're educating themselves more on all these different strategies so they're the ones that are actually doing a lot of deals on that um so that's kind of i try to explain it to them and and explain to them what the benefit is and oh why not i'm like well i'm willing to take over and make those payments on behalf of the seller why don't you make those payments if you're trying to sell the property for him a realtor wouldn't do that and i get that and i respect it that's the model but my model is that going there solve the seller's problem solve the how problem. to help them out you know then typically depending on my exit strategy finding an end buyer that i could put into the property or another investor or i hold it and do a rent to own or something like that where they can become homeowners so it's a win for them as well so it depends on the situation of it mm -hmm. um but it's really the whole thing is really you're helping the seller out sure. that's the bottom line you sure. know and back to what you said before they're mm -hmm. crazy why wouldn't they do that i can show on paper and i've done this before we had let me give you an example of one in north carolina we had a couple they've been trying to sell the property in north carolina it's been sitting they moved so they're um i believe they were making two payments they were kind of getting a little desperate or whatever the situation was i don't remember exactly exactly but anyways they're open to doing some type of seller financing um but they wanted it paid off within three years mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. yeah exactly i don't feel comfortable in this market especially at the top dollar what they wanted sure. and i'm willing to pay top dollar for a property as long as i'm getting terms your strategy right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so they wanted to have it paid off and i just didn't feel comfortable doing it so what i did is i did an amortization schedule mm -hmm. on i have an app i sent over the amortization schedule to the sellers i pulled it up i said let's pull it up let's go over together it's a pdf document on the top shows the interest rate shows the payment shows the purchase price and the amount finance i said go down to line one um payment 120 that's 10 years in this scenario that i'm going how much money would you have collected it goes uh eighty nine thousand dollars and something i go over to the right what is the remaining payoff balance 
he, he said whatever the dollar is. I said, add those two numbers together. He added them up. He said the number I said, how much are you selling the house for? I said, what's that difference? Mm -hmm. He was making an extra $129,000 yeah. extra for doing this. And, and because of that, he ended up doing a 10 year term. Mm -hmm. So that's why a seller would do it because they can diversify having, you know, versus the stock market. When you buy stocks, you, you don't have an asset that you can't take back. And quite frankly, you know, if I had a property and I never allowed this happen after five years, I've been making payments and that property's been, that mortgage has been paid down and you want to take that property back from me, mm -hmm. <laughs> honestly, Perfect. but I wouldn't allow that to happen. Right, right. No, I mean, I understand what you're trying to explain. It's like the doctor, right? This could happen. That could happen. So you, uh, it takes me to the the risk management part of the uh, transaction, right? So risk management is crucial in real estate. What are some uh, key principles you follow to minimize um, risk in creative finance, finance and investments? Number one, be ethical, be upfront never mislead anybody always be truthful because again this is me marriage stuff's going to come out always be direct so even if the conversation is not the way you it's going to be going that you feel uncomfortable you're going to have it anyway so just be direct and be ahead of it um risk management i always look at um whatever the number one thing i look at is whatever the median price range for that area is i like to stay 20 percent above or 20 percent below because that's where your main buyers are going to be um, let's say, for example, let's just use, uh, say it's $250,000 for that particular median price range. So the max I'll go up would be like 300,000 and the low I'll go down to roughly, it would be about uh, 200,000. So stay right in that ballpark. That's where the main buyers are because you can get a property through seller financing easily. Like say in that market, somebody's like, oh, I got a home at 600,000. They're, they're desperate because they can't sell their homes in, the, mm -hmm. you know, in a slower economy market. So, but you can get that property, but then you're going to have a hard time finding a buyer for that property. And it's going to take you a while to find a buyer. So that's how I let, that's one of the risk management. And then the second thing is, you know, what is the monthly cash flow? How much capital do I need to put down in a property? Um, for me, I, you know, you can find other seller finances, but they want a large down payment, like 50,000. Yeah. For me, I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, like for example, oh, I want fifty, sixty thousand dollars. It for me, it does not make sense to deploy that much capital into one asset. I can take that capital and deploy it into several assets. So those are the those are that's kind of how I look at it. I, I look at trying to I want my capital back in about twelve to eighteen months, whatever I put out, and then I also look at the monthly cash flow. Um, that's the key. Um, some markets are tough. You know, you got to really underwrite your deal and, and just don't jump into a deal because you want to do a deal. Um, you just got to make sure and just be selective. So, uh, do you buy and hold all of these transactions, or do you? Um uh, wholesale them per se to another investor majority of them i will um stay in mm -hmm. uh, i want to hold that's majority of them um there is times where the numbers don't work mm -hmm. and i will um bring somebody else into the deal like uh, another investor or something like that or another or just help out a seller in a situation um and i tell them up front like this deal is not doesn't it's not good for me but i may know somebody and if mm -hmm. i bring somebody i may make a couple of dollars from bringing the buyer to you you know something sure. like that it depends it really depends sure, but majority majority of the time though i want to i, I want to get into the deal and do it sure and uh, are all your deals single family homes not at all um that's the beauty of once you understand these strategies you can use them for anything mm -hmm. um let's see i, I purchased a, a 13 units with zero down mm -hmm. that was great we closed uh august 30th okay and um you yeah, know we closed august 30th and two days later we collected a little bit more than ten thousand dollars in rent checks so on that property yeah. where was that uh, where was that purchase and i'm surprised that florida has those type of properties i thought it was also that was that yeah that was actually new england Oh, okay. um so yeah somebody knew that i purchased properties um they lost the father used to purchase properties and uh was a landlord he passed away and then the daughter took it over and she got in a motorcycle accident and didn't make it that was running it so the mother was just overwhelmed so but the mother liked passive income but she didn't like dealing with the tenants and everything and I'm like okay how much money do you need a month to live off of she wanted 2500 so we negotiated down to 2300 and um yeah so we did we did really well on that one now we did have to put some money into that property um the wiring the wiring in that place i just like i'm surprised that place didn't burn i was just like 
<laughs> I was just like, whoa. I mean, they had the, the owner used to do his own wiring in back in the day, and he, he had wires going to one unit to another, and the other tenant was paying the other. And then he, then the breakers, he somehow rigged the breakers so they wouldn't trip. I'm like, so we had to, we did put some money in there to rewire and fix that property. <laughs> totally worth it, I bet, because you get it for nothing. I end up taking a property, also six unit, uh, eight unit property for nothing, and end up getting paid seven percent um, commission too. So those are definitely that's why brings me to another question how important it is to network with people because once you have those numbers um yes it may be a little bit of work a little bit of time to understand but once you have a deal and you can explain it to a potential investor because the investor wants to make sure that the numbers work right and so once that you're able to do that then the way i did it i didn't have any money i knew the property needed it had a um potential for another four so it was only 50 percent occupied it was bringing 20 percent cap rate the investor was tired of the of the tenants he was in ohio we tried to sell that for many times for for at least a year and a half i was the listing agent and um, he actually put it under contract for a hundred thousand dollars less the buyer walked away and that's when i'm like well he already reduced it let me see what else i can do and so it had the opportunity to bring this this other um four units to uh, income opportunity and that's how i end up that's the only reason i took over because it was in a um it was a d-class neighborhood and I wasn't fond of it for many reasons, just being able to manage it, you know, deal with a section eight and all that, that I'm not, it's not my specialty, but I figured it has a lot of room for us to make quick money. So that's what we did. We kept it for three years and then sold it as soon as we could because it, it you know, just the tenant, the type of tenancy. <laughs> and, and honestly, I preferred, which I, I'm going to go to the next question with you. What's your best, your preferred exit strategy? Are your properties just traditional uh, long-term tenancy or what are your best? Or is, that, is that the main source of your business um, strategy? You know, I, I, I want to back, great job on that, by the way. I love <laughs> that, that's nice. So, you know, one thing I, I do want to point out is and a lot of people like, oh no, I don't want to invest in a blue state or I just want to invest in a red state. And you pointed something out there. Let me tell you, um, you know, you have to understand a lot of the, based off the regulations in whatever state, if it's landlord friendly or not, um, I'll do deals in all those states. Um, but I got to tell you something, if it's a state like um, that's not landlord friendly, mm -hmm. go section eight underrate it based off of section eight because you're okay. going to have guaranteed money so use the government's money on your behalf to help you and a lot of times people don't even understand realize this that there's money there that they will give you as the owner the landlord to improve the properties i had one of my properties it was a two bedroom one bedroom bath only 800 and like 75 square feet i got thirty five thousand dollars from the government to be able to improve it and after five years that will go away that bond or that grant right. wound up going away, right. but I got to put somebody, a government affordable housing in it. So use it to your advantage. You know, a lot of times I hear people in Florida, I won't go here, I won't go there. You just got to understand your strategy. When you underwrite it, you got to underwrite it based off of section eight. Don't go off of market rent rates. You know, down here in Florida, like where I live, section eight wouldn't work in my market because okay. of the rents would, I can get right. more. So you have to look at your market and understand, uh -huh. but keep that in mind. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm not. And that's the reason why we got rid of all of them, because Cook County is definitely not a landlord friendly. It is the worst of the worst. I mean, we are just like New York, right, where you can keep uh, a tenant can stay in your house as long as they want. Um, a um, how do you call those people that just go in there and live there? I mean, it's just a night. Squatters. Yeah, squatters. Yeah. I'm just tired of it. So I've been shifting and obviously working with Riviera Maja, but I mean, and I like Tulsa. I like Tulsa, Oklahoma, because it's very affordable. It's in the, it's, it's up and coming. The economy is booming there and the, the housing, the middle house, there is like $250,000. So like you said, you can use FHA there. I mean, you're, you're right that there are ways 
people ask me, how do you do this long distance? Easy, just go into my prop stream and analyze and connect to others. I'm actually, and I was going to ask you, <laughs> what do you think about, I am like, taking all these classes and learning all about it. That's why I have not been very social on the social network uh, media, but assisted living facilities. I am going crazy over learning about how you can get one, you can make money. And, and because of my commercial background, immediately I figured this is like a daycare center that the government can pay you. Or I also hear the conversations with my own friends who are 50, 60 years old dealing with their, not dealing, but going through those processes of having to pay private for their parents to stay in a house or facility. And so I'm learning a lot. What are your thoughts on assistant living or transition housing, sober living, all of those uh, business models? Oh, um, I've, I invest in those. So I, I like those. Um, you know, I'll look at even split pad. I don't know or if you've seen that model yet. Um, no. or pad split. So that's another model. It's like, uh, you might want to check that one out. Um, it's another in working class. So what it is, is because nowadays, you know, the economy, inflation, what crazy, we, we printed so much money in our country. Those prices are never going to come back down. Even though the inflation numbers come down a little bit, the prices are, are never going to come back down. Look at the cost. So what's happening now is people need to start sharing. They can't own the whole apartment to themselves anymore. Yeah. So now what they're doing is in split pad model is you rent a room out at the place and what they're doing is in some of them is they're taking the living room and converting them into two more bedrooms so there might be like six seven bedrooms so that they're renting that they're renting them out and also what they'll do is they'll look at um properties that um for investors so an investor will buy a property they look at where it's located you want it to be near public transportation and you don't want more than like two or three people that have vehicles because if you have a six bedroom home seven bedroom home you can't have all those vehicles there so that's kind of what the model is so that's one of the models what they're doing so they're actually making them they put furniture they put locks on the doors they have like their little kitchen that they all kind of share and so that's that's the same type of model um but yes uh, the residential senior living that's been around for a long time that's uh, a really good area um, to invest in, um, and I've done some of those. You know, I, I really, you know, they're they're good things. They're the problem we're seeing right now is because it's so hot. These people are asking crazy amount of money for these properties right now. Um, you know, the sellers because they know I, I had one. The numbers were way out of whack. It just didn't make sense. Another one that was up in New England um, that they were open to. So it's it's hard to find those at the moment. You know, those type of things. But you can take a a larger home like six, seven bedroom home and do that as well. You just got to look at your municipality regulations. That's, and do that. that's where that's a part where I am right now. So I went on Facebook to all this assisted living groups. I join, I talk to all these women. So now I have connections in California, in Georgia, in Texas of women that have done this before, but they don't know anything about how to get the real estate. So I went in there and I'm like, I need to know, I need to learn all about your, your um, operations and I'm willing to trade information of how you can get a seller financing. So a lot of these women are so, this is a beautiful part. I said women, because a lot of these people that re, uh, answer back to me were women, 100% of them actually. And one thing that I love about this, and that's when I click as a commercial uh, real estate transaction, is that all of them said to me, Oh, my place, I'm renting my, I already had this operation business in this house and I'm just renting the property. So they already, it's easy for them to understand their renting. What they don't know is that we can rent it with an option to purchase. And when I'm mentioning that, they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh my God, this is so easy. Because they all think, they all have one or two houses and they think they have to go through this financing to get another one. They, they are ready to make, to get another one going. So that's when I put my thoughts together. I'm like, well, let me, let me help you. Let me tell you how we can do this. And I've learned, I've already took some online classes. So I learned that Texas is one of the easiest states that are least regulated. And these women are ready to go. So I'm just putting all these pieces together. But I wanted your thoughts on that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what I do on those, I'm the one that's put buying the deal. I put it and do a lease option with the seller and I'll make them my tenant. 
and have them run the business so I don't have to and I'm I can charge that's higher rent on it. So that's what I want to do. But I like to I like to pre-qualify the operator. So mm -hmm. that's why I have these conversations with them. I want to see how confident they are. I want to see what level of information they have because they're gonna be my tenants. So that is yeah. Yep. And I do that. I do a partnership like, hey, I'll let you come in. You don't have to put first, last or anything down. You don't have to worry about it. We'll we'll split the you know, you generate the income and we'll have to put this amount of money away to make sure that the mortgage is being paid or whatever. And then whatever profits from there, we can split 50 50. I've done creative uh, structures like that as well. So you have the owner operator there or do you hire the owner or the, the operator? Usually I would go into a partner with that owner operator. So, hey, I'll bring the real estate aspect of it. I'll structure that, put it together uh -huh. um, where I can, and we'll do it as a lease agreement, even though I'm going through and I'm buying it through a lease option or one of my okay. strategies. But then I'm also partnering up with the business of it too. So I'm kind of making it on both sides. And sometimes I've done both the real estate aspect of it as well. But most of these times they're just looking at owner operator. They don't care about the real estate aspect of it. So I'm, I'm the one structuring it more as a real estate where I take care of it. And I, I, but I charge a little bit more in the rent because I know um, how much more they can make off of it. So let's say the rent is like $4,000. I may go to like $5,300 or something like that. And they they like it because they don't have to come up with all this capital to go into first last security, whatever, something like that. And I'm also getting profits from the owner operator side of the business. Do you make them come up with all the cash and you're just a transaction coordinator per se, or the part business partner, um, sweat equity, or if you, if you can share, of course. Well, it depends. I try to negotiate with the seller where I don't have to put a lot of capital down. So if I don't have to put a lot of capital down, then I don't have to put it in there, but I'm, I'm gaining more control and more percentage of the deal because of it. But you have to come up with some capital, even if it's just one month rent or deposit or whatever the case may be. Do you make the operator yeah, yeah. come yeah. to that? Yes. I always yeah, do I can so. do something like that. Yeah. 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 I, 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 yeah. Usually I, it usually is like one month's rent. I mean, I did one for a hundred dollars down, you know, and I, I, that worked for me. I negotiated where I end up getting two months of no payments. Cause I said, I'm taking care of their maintenance and repairs. Right. You don't have to worry about it. Right. I've, I've that right. Cause that's, that's what, again it um reminded me of commercial because there's so many ways that you can again six months off of rent whatever the case may be in some cases um but um this is great information so do you are uh, your partnerships all in florida or i mean of these assisted living facilities all over all over and you know it's amazing because you hit the nail on the head majority of them are women all of my women because women are caregivers and they understand it so they they're all i have one that's a, a gentleman um but majority of them they are women that because they know how to run it they because they're taking care of the elderly their caregivers their story has always been i started because my mother or my auntie or my grandmother somehow and what i like about them is that they took the initiative to go to one of them went to catholic charities to get the information they all have taken the steps to get there then their head in their you know light bulb click and said oh i can make money off of this um and they go on the medicaid medicare route they i've been educated by all these girls i give no idea it's fascinating some of them are in california so we're like in, on the phone until midnight some of them are in florida i'm in texas it's really fun and my uh college friends from mexico are looking at this ads and they're calling me how can we start investing there for mexico here which i think it's a great opportunity um this is like my favorite this is where i'm going to put all my time and money because one of the things that i've done is i've gone through i've grown in real estate for the last 20 20 years portfolio i've lost it i've gained it back i've lost it back you know with between the 2008 and i went through the war so you know life changes and a lot of people my age probably feel that it maybe it's too late or maybe they don't have the capital or but the idea here is to show them that regardless of their the age or the capital the knowledge is the most important part and putting knowledge into practice right but we we're, we can still make this happen with no money and no big job or not big cre credentials as pay says right 
um, it is doable. It is totally, I mean, I feel that one house will change in an assisted living facility will change one person's life or one family's life. Just one of those. So I, I you know, you, you're talking about age. I feel people at our age tend to, you know, their children are gone off. You know, they're at an age, they got to start thinking about their retirement, like they need to start doing stuff. So I see a lot of people, you know, they worked for a long time and now they're, they're looking to trying to change something up and they're looking at, they're at a point where they want to start having some free time and start enjoying their life. So that's where I see a lot of people our age coming into real estate to learn these things. That's what I've always been noticing. Yeah, and, and part of the reason I'm trying to do this is to show women, not, not only men, but women that we can do this, immigrant women. I have, I just met recently with a lady that's a little go-getter. She has a little uh, a business, a uh, cleaning company that she's uh, building on the commercial side. And she we talk about this com uh, creative uh, real, uh, real estate opportunity with assisted living because her mom just passed away. She went through all this training and but I just feel like most of them feel like this is a big dream because when they talk, they think assisted living, they think about these big facilities with two, 300 uh, beds or situations like that. But that's my goal is to, to get to know, get more people um, interviewed that are doing this so they can communicate this message to them. It's, it's doable, it's possible. I, I know a lot of nurses. A lot of ladies that are I working as nurses, those are the ladies that should be thinking about this. They have a really good job, probably a good credit and a good 401k. Most of them have a house. They've been in a house for 20 years. They have all these tools they can plug together to get this started. And the cool thing about this and the part that I like the most about assisted living is that it's a tsunami coming up right now with the seniors coming. There is a There is gonna be a shortage of beds because for many reasons first off i don't think there's enough beds as it is right now even with the large facilities but also there is a little the the appeal for the boutique kind of service right the smaller the the one single family house with the seven bedrooms and it's just a fascinating fascinating subject and the proof that in real estate you can there are so many strategies and the other thing is, unlike Airbnbs, everybody's going to bed by 8 p.m. at night, so you don't have to worry about the parties. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, yes, there are no parties. There are a... Um, well, they do their happy hours. They start their happy hours at noon, so keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you they're enjoying be, life. You, you know, are, they're having fun. You and it's I like are going there, so we can't wait to have our noon parties, huh? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, think about it. It's like the golden, remember the TV show, The Golden Girls? Yes. That's, you know, it might be before a lot of people's times, but probably our listeners, they they know exactly what it is, you know? It's a great show. It's funny that you mentioned that show because that show, they use that show as a reference to kind of distinguish what kind of housing. It's not going to be your 100 facility. It's not going to be The Golden Girls. It's going to be me and my girlfriends, by the way. It's in the middle where you need you need help getting up to go to the bathroom or the remind reminder of taking your pills or maybe in this houses that these ladies buy because it's sort of a little bit more um, high end, if you will. They hire a chef for them to to cook. So it depends on on obviously the um, demographic or uh, that you're catering to. But it's again, it's fascinating and it's guiding me away from section eight cook county <laughs> i'm sure you know what i'm referring well you you got that that's the worst count one of the worst counties in the country so i i hear you and, I, and the um, people live there know it and they take advantage of it. that's the sad part you know they just take advantage of uh owners and it's just uh, i've seen nightmare stories i saw i felt so bad for this one couple they bought this town home um in their 20s and it's so a shame so they bought this uh, it was a townhome they bought in their 20s and they wanted to start a family. So they just said, instead of selling the townhome, they're like, okay, we're going to rent it out and that's going to be our retirement, you know, help out for our retirement. So then they purchased a home, started raising a family, and then the COVID hit and the people there just stopped paying. They wouldn't pay. And then they tried it when COVID was back, they still wouldn't pay. And then that county was just, they just took almost over a year on top of it. 
So these people were into it for almost three years, and these people are still living in the property. They had these the fan, the people that own this property had to dip into the four hundred one k their own savings to be able to allow these people to live there. And these people had a brand new Mustang, and they have pictures of them going to Disney with their family on vacation. Meanwhile, they're living there for free, taking advantage of this other family of that their dream and so it's so sad that the governments allow that people stealing from other other people in a sense that that's how i look at it i'm sorry right. about that but i just felt no, no, no. Sad it, for them. it is it is unfortunately and and that's one of the reasons i never thought i'll be saying these words you know being the immigrant and always like but once that you get into the entrepreneurship shoes and start being affected by it then you get to see those things it is i mean i love this city with my heart I, it took me a while to to be here to be happy and 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 but i dislike the you know local government it just doesn't make sense in many things so now i'm like my friends also talking but it, it's it, it is sad and that's why i mean so that's a consequence of a lot of this investors selling to foreign investors to using these properties for Airbnbs and turning them into an expensive tenancy state. You can't just you can't help it, but you know, just to fight that somehow. But um anyway, I know we're running out of time here. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say one of the biggest issue is you know the government is creating it where the middle class is getting hurt and the hedge funds are the ones coming in buying the real estate because people like ourselves we can't can, afford yeah, to go into right. a property and allowing somebody to live there for free meanwhile the hedge funds are coming in and acquiring all this up now so they're creating a more the government's creating more of an issue on this uh for not helping the middle class of like owner property and doing the right thing because and i get it there's definitely need to have for housing mm -hmm. but now people are taking advantage of the situation of the law you know that's that's the part but anyways right. let's get on to that something different but <laughs> You know, it's always great coming on. I always enjoy. It. I could sit here for hours and hours. I know we've talked for doctors. hours. But before you, before you, um, you take off. And thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I did want to say earlier when we started. Of course, I jump into the questions. We do have other two episodes where you get to uh, know more about Mark, um, a little bit more of his history. Since we've been doing this for this is our third time, I, I went straight into the into the questions, but. Tell me just quickly before you leave, what your your tip for somebody that is just getting started? What would you say? Um, how would they get? How should they start? I would I would say um, find an experienced investor and bring value to them, and they'll teach you in return. Like go out there and try to find deals. Meet with an investor. That's how I started. Um, just find an investor and say, hey. I want to bring value. Let me bring deals. What's your buy box? And then bring deals to them and in return say, um, I want you to teach me. That's kind of what I would say. Sounds great, Mark. And I know that you do have a mentoring a program and uh, you have your groups. Where, where can somebody find you and where can we find your book? Sure. Um, the best bet is uh, go to my website. It's Mark. You know, my name is Mark Monroe, like Marilyn Monroe. It's, so it's Mark, M-A-R-K, the minus sign, Monroe, M-O-N-R-O-E dot com. Or just jump on any of the social medias and just type my name in Mark Monroe and put real estate with it. And most likely it'll come up. So and, and my book's on the Amazon. So it's called Creative Real Estate Investing or just search my name over there on Amazon. And we will put the link on the comments. And well, thank you, Mark, for the invaluable advice and for joining us today. It's been truly enlightening, an enlightening discussion to our listeners. If you're ready to take the uh, your real estate investment to the next level, I highly recommend picking up a copy of the Creative Real Estate Investing. Dive deep into the strategies and wisdom of uh, with Mark that Mark has to share with us today and start transforming your approach to real estate in life. And as, remember that the journey to financial freedom through real estate is a marathon, not a sprint. So stay curious, stay creative, and most importantly, stay tuned to Viva de Tus Rentas for more empowering episodes that will help you live off of your rents. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more updates. And until next time, 
keep investing wisely. Thank you. <laughs>